Welcome to the uh, September Soils Network of Knowledge webinar and thank you everyone for attending. Now um, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Dr Nikki Seymour. Nikki works as a senior soil microbiologist with the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries where her research focuses on soil biological processes in agriculture, particularly those involving the beneficial soil microbes associated with crop growth and nutrition. Nikki's going to present on a subject that so many of um, our SNOC subscribers have requested and we have had a registration of almost 70 people and that sort of attests to the interest in this uh, sphere of soils endeavour. And today Nikki's going to cover an introduction to soil biology, why it's important for crop and soil health with specific reference to the impacts agricultural practices have on soil biological components and how that might relate to crop productivity. Okay, thank you Abby. Thanks everybody for uh, tuning in today. Righto, so today I'm going to talk about soil biology, a little on the management in our cropping systems and as Abby said uh, a little bit about myself. I work with the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries here in Queensland. Um, I'm based in Toowoomba and I work a lot on the Darling Downs, also the Southern Downs, but do venture into New South Wales occasionally as well. And my interest is beneficial microorganisms that aid crop nutrition and productivity. In particular, I've, I've looked at mycorrhizal fungi, uh, rhizobia in our systems and how they impact on our nitrogen nutrition. And also I have a keen interest in the soil nematode communities because not all nematodes are bad and we'll talk about that in a little while. Most of them are really useful. Uh, also as Abby said, I've worked, worked in broadacre cropping, mainly in cereals and pulse crops. I've done a little bit in cotton and sugarcane as well, but um, largely those crops that are grown here on the downs. So cereals, wheat, um, sorghum, mung beans, chickpeas, those sorts of crops. So I'll get into my seminar and I just start with a quote because I love it. If a healthy soil is full of death, it is also full of life. Worms, fungi, microorganisms of all kinds. Given, the only, given only the health of the soil, nothing that dies is dead for very long. So it talks to me about the cycling processes that go on in our soils and how important microorganisms are for our, the health and the life of our soils. And Wendell Berry is a US um, philosopher and writer, but he captures in my mind a lot about the cycles that go on in our soils and are important to us. So firstly we're talking about soil health. What is a healthy soil? A soil's capacity to function as a vital living organism within ecosystem and land use boundaries to sustain plant and animal production, maintain or enhance water and air quality and maintain plant and animal health. That's from Dr. John Doran and Zeiss in, um, also from the States. But it talks here about how a soil's ability to be able to support the living system that it, that it is, but also it, it has boundaries around it. So a healthy soil is one that um, maintains, um, I guess, all of those, those issues, water and air quality, but really a healthy soil is also fit for purpose. So a soil can be healthy for one purpose um, in terms of growing crops. It may not be the best soil to, to have a forestry on or it may not be the best soil for horticultural crops compared to something like um, wheat or, or cotton, but it, it has its purpose and we can use that purpose to um, to maintain the best soil that we can or the healthier soil we can. Soils also have resistance, so they have an ability to resist change due to soil disturbance and also a resilience. The, we talk about its ability to recover from disturbance and a lot of that is, to, is due to the soil biology in the soil, the living component that can re, um, revitalise or um, yeah, re, resist those changes that are happening to it are very much linked to the soil biology in our soil. We know and you probably know that soil biology is extremely complex, it's a difficult thing to study, um, it's been the black box of many, many soils studies for a long time and it's mainly driven 
by organic matter inputs. So to keep our soil biology going and to keep the complex um, soil food web that we need there to, to keep our soils healthy, we have to have organic matter inputs. Um, it's all part of that cycle as we talked about at the beginning of the talk. Just really important to keep organic matter going into that soil um, and keeping the soil food web as broad and diverse as we can make it. There are some numbers there on the screen about estimates of microbial populations that have come from various literature, but in one gram of soil, that's an a equivalent of a dry gram of soil, bacteria can be up in the, in the billions, actinomycetes, fungi all in the millions, um, there's algae, protozoa, and that's just a small part of our component. So there are a lot of organisms. And um, a person once said to me, or someone um, who I respect in the soil biology field said that, that in a handful of soil there are more organisms than there are people on our earth. So we know that there, it's a very, very complex living um, organism, the whole soil structure is, is dependent on our biology and we know that it's very difficult to study because it has been difficult to get the tools to actually look at these organisms. Um, through traditional methods of, of plating and culturing and, and trying to extract things from the soil, uh, we've only been able to get about 10% of all the organisms. So we know that um, there's a lot more and we know that through DNA and molecular studies these days. There's um, a busy but um, and messy slide, I guess, that talks about the soil food web. Um, and I do keep meaning to try and change that a little to make it look a bit better. But it's it's it also demonstrates that it is a very busy place in our soil. And hopefully, in um, if your soil is healthy, you've got lots and lots of all of these different groups of organisms that are working together or feeding off each other. They actually um, have a feeding pattern and, and we know that the more of these organisms we have the better it is and the faster all of those functions that are listed on that right hand side can happen. So there's lots of good things about having all these organism, in as, organisms in our soil. Um, the main ones there are listed or grouped into categories of nutrient cycling, organic matter turnover, they help with soil structure, um, biology involved in disease transmission and control. And then the last one there is agrochemical degradation, which I'm not going to talk about a lot today. It's a whole subject in itself and there are projects working on that. But certainly um, the soil biology are very important in, in degrading and changing our, um, the inputs that we put into our soils. The point that I really want to make is most of that whole soil food web, most of those organisms are beneficial. So we need them in our soils to actually carry out those functions. They're really important and the more organisms we have, the better they are. We don't want to get rid of them and our whole aim in, um, in the research that I'm doing and in, um, in trying to make more productive soils, the whole aim is to uh, improve the numbers and diversity of soil biological components. So there's that list again of the soil biota that are important and I'm going to just sort of go through some of these last one. But the um, I'll start with nutrient cycling and organic matter turnover together because they are intrinsically linked. Um, and I'm just going to give a couple of examples from some stuff I've done. It's impossible to really talk um, about uh, everything that goes on in our soils and there are books and books and books written on it so um, as you would probably know. So nutrient cycling um, Biology are involved in helping to add nutrients to the soil, so they actually can um, increase our levels of, of nutrients for our plants. And one good example of that is the symbiotic nitrogen-fixing bacteria that we know about, rhizobia. Um, a very good example of how these organisms actually add nutrients to soil or for our plants. And they take it from the, the atmosphere and the, in the soil and add them. They're also non-symbiotic bacteria and um, they also can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and that aids them in their, their reproduction. Um, and when they die, then that nutrient becomes available. So there's other um, organisms that transfer nutrients into available forms or facilitate 
their uptake by plants. So I'm grouping these into large groups. There are lots of different functions. And just some examples, there are nitrifying microorganisms. So we know the nitrifying bacteria that actually change the ammonias into the nitrates so that we can make them available for plants to be able to take them up. Uh, we have sulfur oxidizing microorganisms. Mycorrhizae are really important in most of our crops. 90% of our crops need um, microorganisms and not just crops, so horticultural um, trees as well um, and, and our whole, um, all our plants within our ecosystem. A lot of them are dependent upon mycorrhiza to a certain extent, uh, phosphorus and potentially other, other organisms, things like zinc, copper, are uh, increased with mycorrhizal fungi in the system. There are organisms that solubilise phosphorus and actually take those off that where they become um, attached to soils. Um, and there are also organisms that can cause losses from our soils. So denitrifying microorganisms, the ones that actually um, change out our nitrate and it, it goes off um, and we're lost from the system, um, particularly in wet, boggy situations. Uh, there are sulfur reducing microorganisms. And I guess the whole point of it is a lot of the nutrients are cycled through the decomposition of crop residues, as we know. So by adding our, our crop residues or keeping those on the soil surface, we're increasing them. Just a little bit about rhizobia because this is one area that I've studied and it, it's one of the true examples of where an inoculant um, of a microorganism, um, adding that to a, a system of trying to grow a plant has actually makes a, a huge difference and we know that we can um, add special groups of rhizobia um, depending on the host plant that we're trying to grow. We can add them and we can increase nitrogen uh, in that cropping system by having um, these nodules functioning and working properly on our plants. Um, that very fairly reasonably specific to the host plant so you do need to get the right type of nodules and a lot of the crops that we grow in Australia are not um, obviously not native and so we need to add the inoculant because those rhizobia are not naturally occurring in our soils, the ones that actually make a difference. Some examples of how we can manipulate this in, in our management is things like growing chickpeas for example in our systems. We studied the impacts of something like the row spacing of our chickpeas. So where we can, uh, where we, we may increase our row spacing, we actually found that we were reducing both the biomass of the plant but also this percent NDFA which is the percent of nitrogen derived from the atmosphere. So when we looked at, at a well um, nodulated chickpea crop, um, we actually had a reduction in the amount of nodules and the reduction in the amount of nitrogen that was fixed as we went to wider rows in that cropping system given the same plant population. So theoretically there were the same number of plants accessing the same amount of soil but they actually were reduced in the amount of, of nodulation and nitrogen fixation. So by reducing our row spacing we can actually increase nitrogen fixation and we get a better result for our um, following crops as well as the amount of, of nitrogen that's feeding the chickpea crop itself. So we can use um, management to actually manipulate things. That's just one example of how rhizobia have been very important in our system and we are continuing to study them. Um, I, do, I also have studied mycorrhizal fungi and um, just in the nutrient cycling space Phosphorus um, and zinc, in particular, are very important um, for um, for the crop plants. And we know that different crops have different dependencies on mycorrhizal fungi, um, particularly the pulse crops, which have a, a less developed or less fibrous um, root system that to access nutrients in the soil. Um, they are very dependent on mycorrhizal fungi, and so we can um, use different crop rotations to uh, actually. Uh, increase our mycorrhizal fungi in the soil through host cropping but also um, different different crop practices such as using things like canola or lupins that don't host mycorrhiza or having long fellows in the system actually also 
uh, can reduce mycorrhizal fungi significantly and that practice in that case then can have impacts on crops down the track that are much more dependent upon mycorrhiza. So moving on to the third um, uh, function of soils, we, we look at biology in terms of disease transmission and control and my work I said is, has really worked, uh, looked at trying to reduce um, the number of pathogens using other biology to uh, suppress those pathogens. Um, pathogens are a part of their soil biology, they're part of the system, but we want to actually reduce the impacts of them in certain systems and, and make that soil healthier for the crop that we're trying to grow. So increasing the biodiversity of soil um, really can, it, it has a possibility of increasing the, the, um, the agents that suppress those pathogens. So a soil, we, we have to remember that a soil that's healthy for one crop may not be healthy for another. For example, there could be pathogens in that soil um, that aren't healthy, you know, that may, may harm cotton but are not going to affect other crops. Um, and bare fallow is one that does reduce disease in general. However, bare fallow is not good for the biology and, of diverse, um, and diversity of our soils. Larger organisms, in particular nematodes, earthworms, can play a key role in the transmission of diseases because they move things around on their bodies themselves because they're mobile in soils. But they can also be involved in the control. And I looked at different um, organisms within soils that may be able to suppress a parasitic nematode called root lesion nematodes. These are very damaging to wheat and chickpeas, in particular in our northern region of, of um, it will, in the in the regions throughout Queensland and, and New South Wales. Uh, and I looked at other nematodes that may be able to reduce um, reduce the presence of the parasitic nematode um, root lesion or Pratolenchus. So um, these nematodes here on, on, on the right of the screen are showing, there's one head of a nematode here that you may be able to see and it's, it's actually eating or trying to eat a, another nematode and it, in its large mouth part there are actually, these are predatory nematodes. You can see a close up of the head here and there are teeth within the mouth of these nematodes. So they're really um, quite aggressive in soils and they eat other nematodes. So the more we have of those is, is also a part of the whole soil food web and, and very important. When I surveyed soils in the northern region around um, in, in the south of Queensland and north of New South Wales, 77% of those soils have these predatory nematodes present. Um, however, they're not in very high numbers, particularly in cropping soils because um, the impacts of management have reduced them. So it's important to try and increase these larger nematodes and important nematodes in our soils. This one here, another type of nematode, it's its head here showing um, a fungal feeding nematode. So they actually do feed from fungi and so fungal networks can be reduced and if you have a large amount of, of a particular pathogen that's grown up in the soil, these nematodes may reduce that as well. However, they're not very specific and they, they eat all types of fungi. You can see in this photo there are some different organisms um, attacking, or they're actually fungi that are nematode trapping type fungi um, that actually grow on the outside and parasitize other nematodes. And here are some fungi that are forming loops and actually making a difference um, by killing the nematodes. This graph just shows um, where I have actually taken some soil from a, a, a property near Billabilla, which is near Gundawindi in Queensland. And the soil um, here, we heated the soil to remove the biology. Um, and this was either from the 0 to 15 centimetre layer or the 30 to 45 centimetre layer. Most of our soil biology we find in this top layer. And where we heated that soil and removed the biology, we were able to recover a certain number of parasitic nematodes. After adding some in, we pulled some back out and we found these nematodes were there. Where we didn't heat that soil, however, and we um, left the biology intact as it was in the field, we actually were able to reduce significantly the number of parasitic nematodes that were still alive in that soil. 
So having biology present reduces the number of live nematodes. They were still there, the parasitic ones, but, but not as high numbers as where we got rid of the biology. And deeper in that profile where there was less biology, there was a, a slight or a more, more increased number. So still significantly different from having no biology, but less biology meant more of the parasitic nematodes. So there's a suppressive effect happening in that soil due to the biology. We call that a general suppression, but it could also be related to all of those organisms that I talked about in the last slide, as well as, as plenty of others that have activity to reduce pathogens in our soil. So there's more work going on in that area as well. One other one is that soil biota are important for soil structure. We know that they can help to bind our soil together in certain ways. Fungi actually running through and, and keeping our soil pads together and making a larger structure. Other organisms like mycorrhizal fungi actually exude um, an exudate that, that it's called glomalin or glomalin and it sticks small particles of soil together so they're able to make a much stronger structure in our soil and keep that soil from eroding or washing away. So it's much better to have a, a much more active community of biology there as you can see. And it's not only um, the fungi that are important but by bacteria as well. And then there's also the, the importance of, of things like earthworms through our soils that really make a difference to um, to allow water and nutrients to flow through our soils and be moved around and all those sorts of things. So really important in keeping our soil structure going. I'm just going to touch briefly on some management effects. Um, I have done that a little bit in the past slides, but one big one of the things that we do in our soil, we, we till our soil, we have to disturb our soil to do different things to it, certainly to grow crops. Um, but tillage really does have an impact. It changes soil temperature, moisture, organic matter inputs, and, and it changes where they're distributed. Um, so it, it impacts on biology. In some cases that can be a beneficial impact, that the tillage may actually change where that organic matter is and we can increase numbers a little bit in some places. However, the best, um, in general, the best scenario is where we have stubble retention with zero tillage. That's um, much more important because disturbance really does reduce biological numbers by exposing them to air, drying out, um, then we, we get a much reduced biological activity and level of biology in our soil surfaces. So stubble retention keeps our surface cooler, allows much more water um, infiltration and zero tillage also reducing that disturbance. Uh, keeps our networks together and, and fungi and really important in keeping um, soil biology much happier. It does however stratify our organic matter and the microbial activity that is kept in the surface as I said. So 70% of our populations are in that top 10 centimetres, about 65% of the activities. And this can have impacts on um, changing where that biology is obviously. if most of the pathogens are working deeper in our soil, for instance, root lesion nematodes can go right down to 60, 80 centimetres in our soil. Then the biology can't get to them because there isn't the amount of, of activity that we need to actually suppress those organisms. And so they basically have a bit of a free reign down there. There's, there are some organisms around roots and we know that there are, it's not a total desert, but the activity is much more reduced down deeper in our soils. Crop rotation makes a big impact on biology, influences the quantity and the quality of our organic matter going into our soils. So we can make a huge difference by changing, diversifying our inputs can diversify our biology as well. Um, but it also changes the hosting ability. So there are many different pathogens, mycorrhiza, and we need to look at what rhizosphere bacteria might be there. All those things can change um, that community and what that soil food web looks like and then how it functions. Fertilisers or, um, or other amendments can make a difference. In general, they increase plant growth which increases organic matter which can increase our soil biology. So in general, they are good things. We want to put beneficial organisms. We do know, however, that there are some fertilisers that in the zone of application can have impacts um, of reducing biology. 
but it, the literature suggests that generally fertilizers, um, the impacts of fertilizers in reducing biology are short-lived and they do um, the redundancy and the actual resilience of our soil biology means that those components come back fairly quickly and we're able to grow better crops because of fertilizers or amendments and we can then improve our biology because of the increased uh, organic material that's going back in there. More roots, more tops that are, um, are not taken off, so it's a good thing. Pesticides, we also know they make a huge difference and I, I said that um, biology can degrade agrochemicals but pesticides can have negative impacts on our biology as well. Uh, there is a project within New South Wales DPI looking at um, the impacts of herbicides, particularly residual herbicides but also glyphosate on um, some of the biological functions in our soils and so it's a bit of watch this space to see what where that data um, or what that data shows, but we are looking seriously at how the components of our biology are uh, positively or negatively impacted by the use of herbicides in particular. Um, insecticides and fungicides when they get on soils can have, have impacts also on our soil biology if they're not reaching the target organisms on the actual plants um, or whether if they're you know, they're also hitting non-target organisms, so definitely can make some difference and insecticides in particular are quite nasty, so we can have huge impacts on biology if we're overusing those products. Just wanted to show one uh, example of some data from earthworms um, and this was at Hermitage Research Station, um, a long-term trial and we could see that tillage and stubble management were really important in increasing the number of um, earthworms within that soil and you know a huge increase where we've got zero tillage and stubble retained they're 54 versus the the um, mechanical tillage stubble burnt treatment making only nine uh, earthworms in that um, in the, in the system. So there's a big difference um, just by changing our management practices and, and you may well have seen that in turn trying to increase earthworm numbers, um, tillage was, is a major issue. Some photos here that were actually from Gupta Vatikatu from South Australia but they do show that microbial composition can be influenced by stubble and retention and here we've got um, an electron micrograph here of some soil particles with very little fungal organisms running through them and this is where tillage was uh, used to incorporate residue. So there's a much faster decomposition and nutrient mineralization of that residue. Faster growing populations, it often tends to be more bacterial dominant than fungal um, because the fungal hyphal network is, has been damaged due to that tillage. And, and we, as a result, there's poorer aggregation, less soil organic matter increase or build up. Whereas here you can see a lot more fungi running through and across the soil particles um, and binding that soil together. This is where we've just had the, the residue left on the surface and no tillage to incorporate it. So it does make a difference um, and there are several examples of, of where tillage has been um, negative to fungal populations, including mycorrhizal populations in a fallow situation. So in summary, soil biological communities are very complex and it's, um, you know, there's lots of books and lots of, lots of uh, research going on, but we're really just still scratching the surface, so to speak. We do know that organic matter drives the the community, the, the actual structure of that community, the makeup of that community and it's important to keep feeding our biology by adding more organic matter into our soil, making sure that roots are able to, you know, that we've got plants growing when we can, keeping roots in the system and um, that that the tops are, you know, are left on or not removing um, organic matter if we don't need to. Soil biology is very important for those five things, nutrient cycling, organic matter turnover, disease transmission and control structure of the soil and the degradation of chemicals. We know that farm management practices impact our soil biology and our research really aims to try and minimise those negative impacts, particularly of pathogens as well, um, and maximise the beneficial biological activity in our soil so that we can improve 
our crop productivity and profitability ultimately. And that's the end of my seminar. Thank you very much, uh, Nikki, for that really great introduction to what is, you know, a very large and complex area of study, like I said before. We have one question already, so there's one person that's quick off the mark, which is great. The question's from Lisa Lobry de Bruin, and Lisa asks, Nikki, how do we increase numbers and biodiversity in soil and which practices would you encourage would you would encourage greater activity? Um, and then what's your view on combining livestock and cover crop for soil biology? Thank you for your question, Lisa. Okay, um, so increasing numbers and diversity, uh, I touched on it really briefly, but really I guess we, we talk about inc having a crop in the system as much as possible and that might be a plant, or it could be a pasture plant. So we know that pastures make a huge difference in the biological activity and an ultimate health of our soil um, and carbon numbers in our carbon values in our soil. So having a root system there as, as often as possible or as much as possible, it's turning over, the roots are dying and growing new ones and we're getting a lot of food going out to the biology through the root exudates but also in the, the sloughing off of, of dead roots and all of that sort of stuff. We have plant material that's dropping on the surface. All of that can increase the food that's available for soil biology. The diversity comes in using different um, different amounts or different uh, sorry different uh, species in that system. So we know that we need not only carbon, but to to feed our biology, we need nitrogen and phosphorus and all those other um, the other nutrients to feed the biology themselves. So um, high carbon level plants and not enough nitrogen can actually starve our our system, and we need to get the um, more nitrogen into that system for those um, biology to keep turning things over. So that's important. As much diversity in the cropping as you can so that the diversity in the biology is increased. Um, so it's all about food source. Combining, it, the other bit was combining animals. Yeah, livestock right? and cover so, crops. Yeah, yeah livestock and cover crops. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think it's fantastic for soil biology if we can do that. Um, I don't see there are very, you know, on certain certain soils there could be impact from trampling, etc. But the more we can um, uh, increase the actual amount of cycling of nutrients and the forms that those nutrients are getting onto onto our plants, the better. Um, cover crops are fantastic because they are actually leaving something on the soil, keeping roots in the system when otherwise that soil might be fallow um, and that's not beneficial for biology at all. So um, I don't see an issue with combining animals and cover crops if the farm is geared up to do that and able to do that. I think it's, it's a great thing. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question, Lisa. We have another question from Jonas Biala and he said that um, he's um, interested to know what the cutting edge um, science, I guess, in this area is at the moment. Would you like to comment on that? Yep. Um, so in terms of agricultural production and soil biology, um, the area has really gone into the molecular studies of trying to look at functions within the soil, um, not just I guess looking at what are the organisms, um, but in functional groups. So the latest soil biology initiative that GRDC ran looked at um, how we can use molecular techniques to have a look at the profile of the community, um, particularly profiling differences in what might be a suppressive soil or one that doesn't seem to be um, conducive to disease. Um, versus one that is, and so that having a look at those profiles and seeing what the differences are. Um, but also looking at the whole nutrient cycling, what genes in biology are turned off or on in terms of their whole um, um, activity and how they are 
in a system what impacts things like adding a fertiliser may do to a biological community in terms of genetic um, um, suppression of genetic function and having a look at how we can potentially trigger or, um, or retard the actual cycling of nutrients or the, the change in our bio, by changing the biological community. So a lot of that stuff um, in terms of the whole nutrient cycling process is looking at um, can biology be manipulated to um, I guess to trigger um, the whole processes, different processes within the nutrient cycling itself. So that's um, one big area but there's there's a whole heap more um, not only in suppression, there is there's a lot of interest obviously in the impacts of pesticides, herbicides um, on soil biology, and are they um, are they making um, differences? Because you know we are, we have said well there there are some small differences, but the literature generally shows that things come back, they bounce back. But longer term, how are we impacting things? Um, and you know, is it a, a downward cycle or or spiral? Um, that's eventually we're going to get to the bottom um, if we keep going with some of the herbicides or, or some of the um, pesticides we're using. Uh, there's probably there's a whole heap more stuff going no, no, on, and I guess that's, um, great, so that's yeah, actually yeah. a good point for me to step in because we have two other questions that sort of um, interleave mm -hmm. into what you said quite nicely. There's a comment here from Lucas Van Sweeten and. Nikki, he's he said that there's a general feeling that increasing uh, microbial activity or biomass is beneficial, and he uh, has questioned whether that's the case. Should we be more focusing on that um, specific functionality that you mentioned about, rather than the wide mm. biodiversity? Would you like to comment? Um, yes, I. I think we do have to do look at functionality, and you're right. We need to make sure that what well, what are we trying to achieve in the in the situation? Why are we why are we trying to look at the function of this soil? What what are we trying to get to in the end? Um, what are the important components in that? Um, I still believe that in general, microbial biomass. The more we have, then um, in terms of the wider suite of organisms that are operating in that system, the less um, or the more chance we have of of being more resilient in that soil. So there, you know, there's lots of different things. There's, there are redundancies in the functions. So some some organisms can take over other functions that we may have thought were predominantly just one type of organism, but there are other organisms that take that over, we know. So there is some sort of redundancies in that and maybe that's, I think that's what Lucas is saying, well, we really want this sort of function to happen so we need to concentrate on trying to increase that. But I I have uh, still this, um, I think there, there's a real benefit of having more biology in the system than less, definitely, and more um, a diverse biology because they can coexist quite happily, and they do. So um, get as many as possible mm -hmm. and try and, and uh, if one function does get knocked out, then you've still got some backup there. That's yeah, theory. I suspect what you say about diversity and its relationship to uh, resilience in systems is very important and will continue to grow in importance, particularly in Australian agriculture with things like climate change. So yes. I think that's a good mm. a good thing yes. to think about. The other question we had that kind of uh, links to what you were saying before is from uh, Lindsay Johnson. And Lindsay was more specifically interested in what the effects are on soil biology from glyphosate and how long those effects last. Mick uh, Rose is on today and I might see if he's happy to answer that because that project that Nikki mentioned earlier is the one that uh, that Mick and um, Lucas are running so they might be in a better place to to comment on that. Can't get the microphone working. Uh, okay. Do you want to just, uh, what I might ask you both to do then is to type something in. I can read it out if you're happy to do that. 
for the rest of the audience because I know that there's um, there is quite a lot of interest in uh, that chemical yes. specifically. Mick's written a, a short comment but also quite correctly pointed out that if people are interested in the specifics of the questions around glyphosate and the project that he and Lucas and Nikki actually are involved in, that there have been two webinars on that and um, uh, one is at the DPI YouTube channel and the other is with me. So if you're interested in the second one, uh, you can contact me. Otherwise, you can have a look at the DPI YouTube channel. And there's been two papers that have been published about that. One which was uh, a look at the metadata on work that has been carried out in the past and then some survey work that Mick's done out of that project um, with specific reference to glyphosate, I think. And I'm happy to pass those references on to anyone who would like them. They just need to get in contact with me or Mick if you have that contact. So the short answer, he said, is that there's been numerous publications, over 20 that he knows of, and including all sorts of ways of looking at things in terms of soil biology and the effects of different um, agricultural chemicals. And very few have found any significant effects, which is sort of what um, Nikki said, that there's an immediate effect and then the soil biology seem to uh, bounce back. But that work is going on and they're also looking at the breakdown products of some of those chemicals and their persistence in the environment and their effect on soil biology. But if anyone needs any more information, I'm happy for them to contact me. Luke has a question about the biological products on the market and how effective they are in relation to, um, you know, maintaining and building soil biology. Mm -hmm. um, so general Generally, the products that are on the market that people are able to add um, have limited effects on what we think is crop growth um, or productivity. There are some specific targeted ones, and I mean, one product is, of course, rhizobium inoculum, which makes a huge difference. Um, but there are others that are mixed in, other, other products that are out there that are more just general biology and they, they are adding organisms to the soil. However, if your soil is, is ticking along and quite functional, then potentially you don't need those organisms or those organisms don't actually last very long in the soil because they haven't come from that environment in the first place. So my advice, I guess, with the products, I'm, I'm not dismissing any of them, but my advice is really to do some test strips. Have a look on your farm, buy a small amount of the product initially and do some strips in one paddock where you've got the product and you don't have the product. Um, monitor and measure those those strips so you, you can get a good handle on whether they are actually making a difference. It should be that, I mean, the soil paddock history is really important that it is uniform or it is actually within the area that you're testing that you've got the same paddock history. So you've had the same crops or the same fertilizer history or the same um, impacts of tillage or whatever that, so that that's not going to make the difference that you can um, really just test those two products side by side and, and see or test that one product without the other. Um, two strips that make um, a difference that you can actually then monitor and measure that and, and show for yourself whether you think that's making any difference. Generally um, the mycorrhizal products that I've seen haven't been able to add enough of the inoculum of, of mycorrhizal fungi compared to what you could build up with a, a good crop of, of uh, mycorrhizal um, fungi actively working within a system. So if you've got a good host for mycorrhizae, something like wheat or a, a sorghum crop that are actually host it really well and then um, you build up the mycorrhizal fungi, then you shouldn't have an issue or need to be able to, need to have to add mycorrhizal fungi, those sorts of things because the numbers will far outweigh um, what you can actually add in, in um, add from a bag or a so I think the, the whole thing is to, to give it a test and, and see if it really does make a difference. Convince yourself first before you go and spend a lot of money on product. That's, that's, that's nice fine. answer. I think also <laughs> there's perhaps a tendency to think about products the same way that fertilizers are thought of and you're adding ingredients to a cake, whereas soil biology is much more sort of, uh, well, it's an ecology, isn't it? 
Yeah, I agree. Um, and it, it, some of the organisms really um, not not necessary for our soils. Um, you know, if you know, they may they may not be important at all or make it a lot of difference in there. Um, they may make some difference, but I think you've got to add a lot more of them um, compared to managing your soil in a way that's uh, you know keeping um, as much organic matter on the on the surface of your soil as you can and trying to improve the soil health in other ways other than um, just adding a product in to try and fix it. There's another question here from Bede O'Mara and Bede asks what are Nikki's thoughts on the effectiveness of biological catalysts being added onto traditional fertilisers? Did you want to add anything more to what you just said previously, Nikki, about that? Um, yeah. So, but I haven't really, <laughs> I haven't done the studies. I haven't tested them myself. Um, but I do feel that there's some merit in it. Um, I think that we can make a difference in um, triggering. Um, or holding on to our fertilizers a bit longer or triggering when we're actually breaking them down. So I think that there's there are some things that can make a difference in that space and, and I haven't done the research and I think it's still evolving and still coming out but I think that, that it's worth pursuing to look at um, timing of release of different nutrients for crops um, and not um, yet yeah, trying to, to break those nutrients into being plant available at the right times when the crop needs them, that there's some, some great merit in it, If, um, but I haven't got any specific things that I could say on it yet. I haven't done any of the data, uh, any of the, the, the testing myself. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Speed, for the question. Um, so the, a similar thing. Yep. Um, uh, from Lindsay Johnson and he's asked specific, specifically about things like um, kelp and fish hydrolysate and what impact do they have on, on soil biology? Um, okay, so I think obviously there are an amendment to the soil that adds um, adding both nutrients as well as some um, organic material as into the systems um, are going to make a difference as long as those differences aren't things like that, that are hugely um, uh, saline in their application so that you're not changing you know, um, the um, EC of soils that, that could affect crop growth then um, or biological components could be affected by things like the, the saline components or pHs of soils, all of those things. So um, as long as that's not altering that environment dramatically or as, you know, and they're in a the soluble form that's then able to, they're, they're basically adding a nutrient into that system that can then be utilised quite effectively and so that they're all um, useful amendments. And I guess is there also some argument to say that if if the application of a product like that will drive a spike in in the growth of of a population, if you like, in soil biology, but then that's not backed up by more incoming product to maintain that, then it can collapse. Certainly, yeah. If there's not the product that keeps coming, then um, then the whatever it was that responded to that, built up to that, will go back down again. Usually, it doesn't disappear altogether, but there's there are spikes in populations with the addition of those nutrients or those um, specific amendments. So, yeah, it's going to make a difference momentarily until there's no more product and then it's gone and, and yeah. then they've got to find something else. So it's a, a, about maintaining levels, I guess. Yeah. But I, ha again, haven't looked at those specific products. Yep. Okay, thank you. And we've got another question here from Selena Miller who says, does soil moisture or the ability to irrigate crops have an effect on soil biology? Uh, yes, it does. Significant impact. Uh, can be a positive or a negative impact if, if 
um, for example, flood irrigation can make uh, definitely change the soil biological community um, and depending how long that soil is flooded for then um, there can be big changes in the community because a lot of the organisms are aerobic and need oxygen in their systems so um, flooding tends to tip that the other way to an anaerobic system and depending on how long that lasts. However, irrigation keeping soil moist um, certainly makes a difference to uh, bio biology but because it's making also a difference to um, the amount of root growth you've got in your soils, the amount of, of crop production, the amount of, of organic matter that's available to plants, uh, to, to the biology. So all of that makes a difference as well. Um, so irrigation is generally um, a, more supportive of the soil biology as long as it's not knocking out a lot of the organisms by making that an anaerobic system. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, the other question that Luke had, which I thought would be helpful for everyone listening, is where is a good place to go for other references or other resources, more information on soil biology? What would you recommend? There are multiple textbooks out there. Um, I guess the thing is to look for is um, are they reputable researchers? Have they done you know, got got a lot of experience in that case, but there are a few that I'd recommend. One more recent one that was put out by Graham Sterling, Helen Hayden, Tony Patterson, Marcel Sterling, called "Soil Health, Soil Biology, Soil Borne Diseases, and Sustainable Agriculture." Just a very broad, um, broad brush initially of soil biology, but it does have some good um, examples of. Um, suppressiveness of organisms, of, of the usefulness of, of organisms. It has great examples through uh, cropping, horticulture and sugar that I can see and a few other things. So um, it's a general guide, he's called it, a guide to soil health and an introduction. So um, could be a useful one to be able to get some great background knowledge and there is some some research, uh, obvious research results and, and some case studies and things included in that. Um, there's a couple of others, but one's called Soil Biological Fertility, um, by, edited by Abbott and Murphy from Western Australia, but was from a, a conference proceedings. So there's a few good books out there about those sorts of things. There is one other question that I missed, and I apologise for this, Sonia. Um, Sonia had a question around herbicides, but um, she says that no-till means using herbicides instead of tillage for um, control of weeds and things like that. Um, is there work being done on alternative systems that don't require the herbicides, i.e. how is this dependence on herbicides being addressed? Can you comment yes. on that? I guess... Um the whole thing is that, yes, we know, we recognise that no-till has put such a reliance on herbicides and now we have a lot of resistance weeds out there because of that as well, not just other impacts that it could be having in the system. So, and hence um, the project that that Lucas and Mika are on with me and, you know, that, that whole no-till system definitely um, swung that whole pendulum that way. Um, there are certainly now research projects looking at a much, you know, an integrated weed management system, uh, which has been, you know, very broadly um, publicised. Um, that one, I guess, the reliance on not just one group of herbicide, but using different types of herbicides, but other um, projects have evolved using, um, you know, harvest seed destructors, all those sorts of things. Um, dare I say, burning of weed seeds. Um, I, don't, I don't really advocate burning but um, in terms of in, in our systems, but there are ways of reducing <coughs> weed seed numbers and weed seed banks in soils that several people are looking at. Um, mulching, those sorts of things as well can make a difference. And, um, and then we're also looking at things like crop competition to reduce the impact of weeds in our system, but to reduce them getting to um, to head and seed banks and, and all those sorts of things. So there's lots of projects going on around weeds um, and 
re reducing the reliance on herbicides. Um, and then I guess um, within our project we're looking at those types of herbicides as well, that the one where we're looking at, at the impacts of, of, of herbicides on soil biological components and do they really make a big difference. Okay. There's a bit of watch the space, sorry. And a final question from Lindsay Johnson says, how long can fungi spores and bacteria last in the soil in an adverse situations, e.g. water logging? Spores last longer than, than hyphae um, and certainly last longer than bacteria in adverse situations of water logging. Um, however, um, every well, there are so many different types of fungi and different types of spores. They have different structures in the way that they they do last, um, and some of them can are quite able to be to last quite a long time, um, not broken down as quickly. Um, particularly sclerates and, and harder walled type fungi. So it depends on what type of fungus you're looking at, um, and certainly the spore form is much more. Um, um, able to resist changes in, in even in things like drying as well or heat um, compared to um, the other forms of the organism. So it's a bit of a how long's a piece of string, but um, it's it can be years, I guess that spores spores can last in soil for multiple years. So and um, they can be broken down in certain situations, but um, I don't know. <laughs> Other than that, it's, it depends on what structure you're looking at. One last question, and I think then we might have to call it a day. It's good to get lots and lots of questions and comment. Um, Lisa Lobridge Burns asked about what um, test farmers can do to examine their soil biology, which is a good question. Yeah, it is. Um, and there are still not a lot of places to go to look at different. Um, biological components of the soil and um, and they're not all available. There are some in the pipe work, I guess, but there are certain laboratories. I guess it's about um, going into a search engine and trying to find out what they offer. And a good place to start is, is looking at um, organic carbon levels in soils, but organic matter that's going into your soils, but also then looking at microbial activity, um, what are the, the, what's the activity like, not just the microbial biomass itself, um, so there may be a lot of biomass, but is there a lot of activity around that, is, is mm -hmm. there turnover in the carbon that's happening because of that, so respiration in your soils. Um, and there are labs available, um, I think through Southern Cross Uni there's one, um, but also there are some private labs. Um, Graham Sterling, who wrote that book, does have a private lab called Biological Crop Protection, but he they, they have limited um, different tests that they can do as well. Uh, there are, um, I'm, not, I'm really, yeah, there's, there's there are a few out there that would be uh, have a look, um, but there are some coming online through the SARDI Predicted B service in that we're trying to not only look at um, the pathogens in that service that show up, um, you know, what are the, the bad guys in our system, but we're looking at having some soil health indicators in terms of uh, the large nematode community groups. And I didn't go into that a lot, but looking at the structure of the nematode community can tell us a lot about the biological community in general because we have different, um, the, the different feeding groups within the bio biology or within the nematode community, so the different feeding groups can be an indication of the different levels of, of different biological groups in there, so fungi versus bacteria for instance versus other nematodes versus um, protozoa, those sorts of things. So we can actually look at those as well. Um, and another thing to not forget about in our biology are things like the earthworms, the larger um, organisms that are there. Um, mites and um, they're really important also in the whole process so you can look at numbers of those sorts of organisms as well. However, there are not a lot of services, um, labs, some labs do do those things, not a lot. 
Yeah, and and it's limited. Lisa said, "Aren't nematodes difficult to identify?" It's my understanding they are, and that's the kind of oh, thing yeah. that you would get a lab, yeah. lab to do. You'd have to have someone who had special yeah. skills, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's right. Nematodes are. I mean, they they can all look pretty similar under a microscope. Then you have to go very much closer into um, the mouth parts um, and the top of the shapes of the, the gut and the shapes of their tails and all sorts of things. There are a lot of nematodes out there. Mm. Um, you can broadly group them and then you can go a lot further into identification as to what their functions are mm. as well. And I think the thing is that you do need to be, uh, if you're interested in this, you do need to be um, have an awareness of what the organisms are doing and and the function that that you're wanting them to carry out and and take it from there because I mean essentially I guess that's why most mm. people are interested in it. Yeah, I do agree, and so and that sort of goes back to um, Lucas's comment and point that it's not just about having, you know, making sure you've got enough protozoa or enough nematodes or enough of these in your soil at a, at a critical level because I don't really believe that we know what all those critical levels are yet mm. or whether they how they make a big huge difference. It's about knowing what functions you want to carry out in that soil and uh, or, or what you really, you know, are, are they hugely skewed one way that, that is making a difference to the function of your soil. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. and actually I think actually it's probably good to mention here something that Luke and I were talking about the other day that, um, you know, and, and a, quite a simple way to make sure in terms of rhizobia that uh, things are as they should is to examine the nodules on your legumes and a lot of people still mm -hmm. fail to do that and um, just assume that because they're growing a legume that that um, functionality is occurring and it may not, particularly if the legumes are not well fed with their other nutrients. So that's really important um, to look at as well. Yep, it's good to dig up soil. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> and that's a very simple one. You mm. can you can do that. Mm. Um, all right, I might uh, call that to a close. It doesn't look like there's any more questions. I hope I haven't missed anyone. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for the really good um, questions. And thank you very much, uh, Nikki, for presenting. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Bye-bye. <laughs>